Hi, welcome back, Attorney Steve Vonder. Today we're talking breach of contract, potential defenses. This is general legal information only and not legal advice. I'm gonna just talk in general about contract defenses. This is gonna be short, but you know, if you're sued for a breach of contract, there's a lot of different issues that can pop up. Contracts was one of my favorite classes in law school. I happened to earn the Amjur Award, which is the top grade in contracts because I really did enjoy it and it's just very logical. And um, so I wanted to share some of my insights with a breach of contract. So basically a contract is a promise or a set of promises that the law will enforce. So I promise to pay you $50 if you mow my lawn. Guys shake hands, you write it down on a contract and it's a contract, it's a written contract. There's also oral contracts, which can also be enforceable. But in most states, I think you'll find it's a shorter statute of limitations, plus oral contracts are a lot harder to prove the actual terms of the contract. But so you get into the contract and then one party says, I'm not gonna mow your lawn, or the other party says, thanks for mowing my lawn, I'm not gonna pay you. That's where we get into the question of breach of contract. And sometimes these cases will go to, for example, in that scenario, a small claims court. And when you're dealing with business disputes, dealing with hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, you're gonna to go to a superior court in your state or whatever types of courts that you have, or potentially even a federal court if you have a federal question at issue or diversity jurisdiction. So um, when you get in that setting, there's a couple defenses immediately to kind of take a look at. Uh, this is not an exclusive list, but number one, you could look at a statute of limitations defense. So every cause of action has a different statute of limitations, okay? So again, check your state. Every state's gonna have something a little bit different for the most part. Um, say you're looking at two years for an oral contract and six years for a written contract. And again, these are just general numbers. But if somebody is bringing a, cause, a complaint after this period of time, you would raise the statute of limitations defense. So that's one example. Um, another one would be statute of frauds. Okay, so say you have an oral contract. A guy says, well, I'm going to um, buy your barn for $5 million. You shake hands and you, then the deal falls out. And then the, the seller says, well, I wanna sue you. You didn't fulfill your promise. And then the um, buyer says, ha ha, this contract was not in writing. Uh, interest in real estate need to be in writing. Contracts for real estate, you didn't put it in writing. There's no deal, sorry, you can't enforce it. I'm raising the statute of frauds defense. So statute of frauds has uh, several different things, many different things, I would say, you know, seven or eight, 10 different things to look at. Certain contracts need to be in writing in order to be enforceable, okay? So look into that. If you're curious, maybe when you have one of the grounds that falls under that. Another one is incapacity. So say you're dealing with elders, like in California, elder abuse is where you have people 65 or older that are being financially abused. So say somebody is on their deathbed and you're getting them to sell and transfer all, all their assets to you and, you, and they're, they're under, in, under uh, medication and this and that, and you slip a paper there and they sign it. Well, a defense to a breach of that contract would be incapacity, that the party lacked the capacity to enter into the contract, okay? Another one in, that would fall under that is minors, minors who are under 18 years of age or even those with mental disabilities, um, people that are maybe perhaps under the influence of drugs or alcohol, where you have issues of, was that person of their right mind? Where did they have the mental capacity to contract? And minors under 18, generally their contracts are not enforceable unless they ratify it. And um, check your state again for your own particular rules, unless it deals with necessities, you know, home living, uh, food, shelter, water, those kinds of things. So there's a couple defenses for you. Another one is mutual mistake. In order to have a valid and enforceable contract, there has to be what's called a meeting of the minds. The parties have to understand what the subject matter of the contract is. And I think this takes you back to the barren cow case in law school where um, they were selling a cow that they thought was fertile and able to have 
babies, uh, baby cows and calves, and um, the price was based on that, only to find out that the cow was barren and could not produce. So there was a mutual mistake as to the subject matter of the contract, and that can be raised as a defense. All right, um, another one would be duress. If you're under duress, okay, this is say where you're out at sea and somebody comes by and they say, oh, you're stranded, I can give you a ride to safety, it will only cost you $2 million, and you could be under duress, of course, you need to, you'll sign anything, right? So um, being under duress, lack of your free will in the formation of the contract can result in a contract being declared invalid, void, unenforceable, duress, okay? Um, another important one is lack of consideration, okay? When, in order to have a valid and enforceable contract, you need an offer and acceptance. So in other words, in my mowing the lawn example, I will offer to mow your lawn. I promise to mow your lawn. The homeowner says, okay, if you mow my lawn, I promise to pay you $50. So you have the offer to mow, the acceptance, yes, we will do it for $50, you have an agreement, and the consideration is something of, it's bargain for legal exchange is what we call it for, bargain for detriment. You're giving up something, you're giving up something as part of the bargain. That is what we call consideration, that consideration, what you're going to do or what you're going to refrain from doing is the consideration. If your contract lacks consideration, it's not gonna be enforceable and this is another defense you can raise. Here's another example under consideration. It, um, you know, um, if I win the lottery, I will give you $500 million. Wow, incredible. And then I go out and I win the lottery and you say, where's my 500? I say, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna pay you. I really didn't think I was gonna win. They sue you for breach of the contract seeking their $500 million. And you say, well, there was no consideration. That other party didn't have to do anything. They did not bargain for anything. There was no bargain for legal exchange, no detriment, nothing. It was just a one-sided contract. So that is what we call lack of consideration. Some people call it want of consideration. So those are some other possible defenses to look at. Um, now we have a couple others that are, that are pretty good. We have impossibility of performance. So say you um, sign a contract that you're going to, your band's going to play in town hall in the theater and you, you sign the contracts, there's, there's consideration, offer acceptance, it's put in writing, everything's great, and then the theater burns down. Well, now it's not impossible, it's impossible to actually perform the contract. So unless the contract provides otherwise, you would raise impossibility of performance impossibility of performance, another defense to breach of contract. Another one is unconscionability. Now this is a rare one and, and I was taught in law school by a Harvard professor and he said, this is rare, do not rely on it. It's not gonna work very often, don't get too excited, but it is a defense for the right situation. And what does this involve? Unequal bargaining power. Sometimes people will throw an adhesion contract. You go to the car dealership, you get the contract and it's not negotiable. You couldn't change it if you wanted to. They'll kick you out of the dealership. Unconscionability is where you have unequal bargaining power and substantive and procedural abuse. It's just so the, the, um, the amounts, the terms, the uh, terms of performance of the contract would be shocking to the conscience such that a court would refuse to endorse and, and enforce the contract, okay? Unconscionability, again, it's not gonna work very often. Remember that parties are generally have unequal bargaining power to begin with. It's very rare you will have two parties of equal uh, bargaining power unless we're getting into the really big companies. So think about that. Another defense to breach of contract, illegality. So if you contract for, let's say, um, I, I'm gonna contract uh, you're going to sell drugs over there, and uh, I'm going to pay you 20% of whatever you sell. That's illegal. You can't sell drugs. That's illegal. So contracts for illegal purposes, maybe it could be gambling. Maybe it could be 
a hit job or whatever the case may be. Anything that's illegal, that contract would be unenforceable and the breaching party could argue that the contract is null and void, okay? Illegality, another uh, potential defense to uh, breach a contract. Couple more, fraudulent inducement. I love this one. Fraudulently induced me to enter into the contract. You told me a lie. You told me things that weren't true. You misrepresented things. You coerced me or you had undue influence over me and you fraudulently induced me to enter into that contract, okay? It's not as you thought it was going to be. You were lying, okay, just to get me to sign on the line that is dotted. Fraudulent inducement to enter into the contract, another possible defense. Two more, i um, let you run here. Impracticability of performance. So say that you agree that I'm going to ship oil up the mountain, um, where I'm going to ship oil up the mountain for, you know, $500 per, per mile, Okay, and then you find out that the uh, mountain gets shut down. It's snowed in. Nobody can get up. Nobody can get down. There's a huge delay, and you're never able to get the thing in on time. Imp impracticability is another... Um, it's some, t some people call this commercial impracticability. And that kind of goes a little bit in line with impossibility of performance. And my final one, frustration of purpose... Um, these are all kind of closely related, a little bit different uh, frustration of purpose. Maybe we entered into the contract for a certain reason. We wanted to build something and then now the land is condemned. And the reason we wanted the land to build a shopping center is no longer a valid option. Frustration of purpose, unforeseen things that change what you were the purpose of your contract so guys these are just a few general things when you're faced with a breach of contract we can help defend your case one thing to note we represent clients in california and arizona arizona is kind of unique the not the party that is deemed to be the non-breaching party can seek their attorney fees so that's kind of a interesting feature that you don't see in california um, in, unless your contract would call for attorney fees. That's about, about what you'd be looking at. But in Arizona, it, the winner to a breach of contract case gets their attorney fees. So that's a big deal. So I hope this has been helpful. General legal information only. If you need help with contract, breach case, whether you're a plaintiff, defendant, you know where to find us on the web at attorneysteve.com. That's attorneysteve.com the first name in legal services. Thanks for listening, everybody. Feel free to share this podcast on your social media networks. Have a great day.